so let's come to the motiva uh, motivation. So the motivation is quite simple. You know, I'm an amateur for photography, and so I've spent much time in, uh, uh, learning something about colors. And uh, I think the knowledge about colors is quite useful. So maybe if, uh, if you have spent some time uh, on photography, you may find that sometimes you, uh, you want to get some colors uh, for your picture. But when you print it out, the colors just change it. So how does it come? And uh, so here are some questions that we may look into. Uh, the first is the, about the photography. Uh, you may, f may encounter some problems that you do, uh, need to deal with colors. And uh, sometimes you may also meet a question of how do you adjust the colors that make, may make the picture look more beautiful to your eyes. And uh, there's also, you may think of this question. Uh, you know, suppose uh, you may think of such a situation. You have a picture on the screen, and uh, you, it looks just like the real things to you. But if there's a dog or a bird in, sit in front, does the same picture appear the same appear still as the same real world to them? Um, and uh, from an another aspect, I think uh, the colors is something like a natural dimension because in this dimension we can encode include uh, a large amount of information in it. Uh, Yes, um, and uh, okay, let's proceed to next. So uh, there's a question here. Oh, okay, let me just introduce uh, what I will talk about in this presentation. I want to discuss uh, the formation of colors. How does colors come about? And then how do we control colors uh, when we deal, are deal, dealing with images? So this has a close relation to photography. Uh, the formation of colors. Uh, there is a preliminary question of how sh can we measure colors? Uh, it's not a thing like lens or something. But ordinarily, when you consider colors, you may uh, attach uh, related to wavelengths. Every wavelength has a typical color. So a color is something same like something linear, and you can attach a number to it. So it is such simple. But when you consider from another aspect, we all know that colors have some. Uh, there are some preliminary uh, primary colors uh, from which we can mix them and uh, produce some other colors. So generally, there are three uh, primary colors, and uh, should we think that? From this aspect of view, that color should be something like a three-dimensional space. So there's some uh, something uh, ambiguous in here. Um, but in actually, uh, color does not equal wavelength. Uh, there's much more richer content in here, and uh, to Name an example, uh, for, for the color white and black, there's not such a light that have a specific wavelength to it, uh, corresponding to it. Uh, we may see that this character uh, appears black, but there are just no uh, such light. It's merely because there are a great many amounts of light around it that this appears to be black. So to look into the formation of mechanism that lies behind the formation of colors, we need to look at the structure of humans' eyes. Um, uh, actually, colors does not exist in the real world. It forms just because that our uh, eyes receive it and our 
nervous system processes signals. Uh, so for the first stage, and, uh, the light in, enters into our eyes, and uh, there are just some uh, special cells uh, in our eyes. There are mainly two types of this. We call it photoreceptor cells. One is like a rod, and another kind is like cone. And uh, the colors, the formation of colors uh, is related to these cone cells. Uh, we have three, three kind of pigments in our cone cells, and they have different response to, to, color, uh, to the light. So uh, we may look at this graph. And uh, the x-axis uh, denotes the wavelength. And the y-axis uh, interprets the strength of the cell's ex ex uh, response to a typical wavelength of light. And uh, we may see that under the, the three lines that uh, correspond to different three different three kinds of uh, pigments, and they have different when the light enters into the cell, uh, the photons will couple with the pigments and uh, pass their energy to the, uh, to the photoreceptor cell and uh, stimulate signals. But for different pigments, they, cross, uh, they respond to the light differently. And uh, there are some specific wavelengths that this response will reach, their, it reach its peak. But uh, it does, the pigments does not correspond to a specific, uh, responds only to a specific peak. Generally, they, they, there are some patterns of distribution. And the, the three kinds of distribution will overlap each, with each other. So in this sense, uh, colors is not absolute. Uh, to understand it, we can uh, say we can make a pure red color, and when it enters into uh, the eyes, it will stimulate, uh, create some signals uh, he, uh, in the in one of the pigments. But we may also create create another kind of pure color, say green. And when it, come, when it reaches some, to some intensity, it will create the same amount of responses in the same uh, cell. So uh, if we only look at a single signal created by the uh, photoreceptor cell, we may not distinguish uh, what, light, uh, what color it is. Uh, so this is the process how our eyes uh, proce uh, process the light and uh, create the sense of uh, color. And the first st step is the occurs in the photoreceptor cells, which I've illustrated before. And uh, be after this process, there are three signals created corresponding to these three kinds of pigments. Uh, one is the, I think someone have uh, uh, say something like this before. So I use the three letters S, M, large, uh, L, to denote these three signals, corresponding to the short wavelengths, middle wavelengths, and the longer wavelengths. And uh, this is the three these are the three signals that encode the primit uh, primitive information our eyes uh, receive from the light. But this is not the final image that uh, occurs in our heads. Uh, after this pr process, it will enter uh, some other cells. Uh, the dipolar cells will pass the information in front to the 
ganglion cells, and the, the interpretation of the image mainly occurs in these cells. And uh, in these cells, there are, there are a class of cells called pulvocellular. And uh, there are two processes that, that are very important uh, occurs here. The first is it will compare the L signal with the N signal, these two signals. And uh, it is responsible for the red-green difference. And the second process uh, it will compare the S signal, the shorter wave, uh, with M and the L together. And, uh, it, you know, the green plus red will create yellow. So it is respons for, respons for, responsible for blue-yellow difference. And uh, this whole process is called opponent process. It says that the color forms in nervous, nervous system uh, from uh, with some in some uh, uh, antagonistic manner, and it's we do not interpret colors by the absolute value of the signals here, but we compare. Oh, sorry, <laughs> compare signals from different channels, and it is this contrast that creates the sense of color. So basically, we have two pairs of contra contrast colors. Uh, one pair is red and green, and another is yellow and blue. And so there just some exist some colors that we cannot see. Uh, so just they cannot exist. Uh, they are the reddish green or greenish red, yellowish blue or bluish yellow. We just cannot see it ordinarily. Uh, now the, the the question comes. Uh, so when we say we know this projector, it just creates three kinds of lights. But how do we simulate the real the image of the real world, which have uh, covers all the wavelengths, uh, but still makes makes the image looks like reality in our nervous system? So. Okay. Just, uh, just one minute to. Uh, okay. To wrap up your um, so I'll now go quickly. And the method is that uh, we can create some color space. We introduce some coordinates and with a pair of numbers and uh, mapping it to the to the signals at this stage, and uh, so what. Uh, looking, by looking into this process, we know that if we can, uh, by inputting some kind of patterns of light, and uh, if we manage to create the same, same signals as here, we succeed. So this is what we do. Uh, there are, people have pro, uh, created several color models to uh, To, create, uh, to store the information of these colors and to reproduce it. So uh, since time is limited, uh, <laughs> maybe I <laughs> need to. OK. So yeah, so I just come to the middle. And uh, this is how uh, color forms in our nervous system. OK, well, thank you. Thank you very much. And let's thank you. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> And so, so much information with the slides. And it's, it's very good to have uh, just one question, only one, if any, anyone. No one else. Can, uh, can uh, anyone else yeah. ask them? <laughs> Pavel, ask a question. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay Pavel, so why do company logos look the same all over the world? Uh huh. <laughs> why do company logos look the same all over the world? Com Company. It was Compare. on the introduction slide. Yeah, you know, uh, for natural light that enters into our eyes, see mm -hmm. this real world, it contains uh, lights of all wavelengths. So there are a great amount of information. But for, say, such image that, create, that is created by the projector, 
it has only three wavelengths. Mm -hmm. So the information is re greatly reduced, and uh, it cannot fully reproduce the real image of the real world. But we still need to, uh, uh, to store and uh, reproduce the, as many information as we can to get a better feeling for the real world. So there's uh, some need that we look into this problem and compare how the uh, how we can manage these three lights to make it more similar to the real world. Okay, let's uh, thank. thank you. Oh. So the next speaker is Yvonne.